بجنگ Is that a no? Welcome, 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 guys. Welcome so much, man. Thank you guys for joining in for another episode of the My Brother, My Brother show, where it is always our goal to encourage one another, one brother to one brother. I am your host, Maurice Fresh. Um, I'm the facilitator of this discussion. Um, today, we come to the end of our fatherhood journey. This is the third episode of the fatherhood journey. Um, with it being April and with it being Autism Awareness Month, I wanted to do an episode um, just dedicated to parents of children with autism. If you just watched that video, that was actually my son, Maurice Rush. He just turned 12 uh, last April, so you can wish him a, a very happy birthday. Um, if you're watching and if you're in the comments, just wish my son a happy birthday. Um, that's me and him and his uh, and my father journey with him as a child with autism. Um, and I, I, I'm just excited to do this episode. I wanted to do it for Autism Awareness Month. Um, if you guys have been following me, I actually sat on the panel for uh, children of, uh, I sat on a panel for black parents of children with autism a couple of weeks ago. And um, I just kind of wanted to uh, do an episode devoted to autism because I gained a lot of followers, right? Um, after that episode. So I just wanted to kind of like bring some other autism parents in um, to the to the fray as well. So um, here we are to do this episode devoted to children, uh, Fathers and children with autism, I want to talk about that autism journey, about those emotions related to being a parent of a child with autism, um, and just kind of like really dig into it. So I think that oftentimes mothers get the spotlight, right? Mothers in general get the spotlight, right, over fathers. And then we think of special needs parenting. Mothers even more get um, get um, the spotlight over fathers and children with autism. So I just wanted to kind of do this to spotlight us as parents as children with autism and kind of like to dig into like our fears, our concerns, um, and our, uh, it, I won't say issues for later, but for lack of a better term, um, is being parents. So um, I have some amazing men that will be joining me for this episode. Um, but before I do that, I just want to, you know, two quick things of uh, nature. So first and foremost, if you would like to, and you're watching this, please follow me on Instagram, follow us on Instagram, the show at the, my brother, my brother show. Um, that's how you can find us on Instagram at the, my brother, my brother show. I'm pretty sure there's nobody else with that name um, out there. So if you type it in, I'll pop right up. Um, also, if you would like to su support anything that, um, I am doing here with the show, you can say any do donations on cash at to dollar sign my brother my brother i'll get them um i would never charge for this but if you would like to donate uh, donate to anything that i'm going here here's the way that you can do it all right so with that being said i have three amazing gentlemen that will be joining us here um the first gentleman that will be joining me um but before the show i actually was saying how he's literally when um, my son got his diagnosis with autism 
he's the first person to reach out to me. Um, literally, he was the first person to uh, reach out to me um, just to say, offer support, the offer is going to be okay to be there. Um, and it was amazing, right, um, that, that he was able to do that. So um, he's an amazing friend. He's a gamer like myself. You know I got a soft spot for gamers. Um, he says he plays basketball. I don't know if he's really good or not. I never hooped with him before, but he says he plays basketball. <laughs> um, and he's a real, real, real dope guy. Um, and I just want to introduce my brother Melvin Little. Mel, what's good, bro? What's up, everybody? Uh, man, how you feeling today, bro? Feeling pretty good. Feeling pretty good. Been looking forward to this. Oh, uh, man, where you at? Where you at, Melvin? Tell the people where you at right now. Um, I'm in North Carolina, but I'm in my car, so sorry about the sunlight. Uh, <laughs> the house is kind of noisy right now. No, it's North Carolina. So, like, when I get people that's not from Philly, I try to, like, make it seem like I'm worldwide, right? Because people, you know, they think you don't know nobody outside of your city, man. I know some folks sometimes, so <laughs> I'm glad that you could join, man. Yes, sir. Look at Dave. Get, get your mortal enemy right there. Dave, Dave just said, uh, uh, Melvin. <laughs> yeah, 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 I see him. I, I can't say what I would normally say to him right now because this is a family-friendly <laughs> show, but <laughs> I love Dave. <laughs> Uh, um, so my next guy, um, man, he has to be, uh, the first person that I ever had give me like 40 points while well, I went in gardening, but he gave me 40 points on the basketball court. <laughs> um, he's a real, real, real good brother, man. Real good friend, man. Really, really talented guy, man. He writes, um, man, when I say anything related to community work, you might see his name related to it, man. He's has really deep roots in the basketball community here and, uh, and, um, Philadelphia. And if you watched, I want to say it's either the second or third episode about going through, you know, child support and custody. Uh, uh, he was on that episode. So he's a returning guest. Um, it's my good friend, my brother, Buddy Hall. Buddy, what's good, bro? What's going on, yeah. Rush? How are you? I'm great, man. How are you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. You worldwide uh, man, rushing in with uh, my man from North Carolina. Are you in North Carolina too? No, 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 no. I said you worldwide rush now with my man from North oh. Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm pretty sure you're from South Philly, bro. <laughs> yeah, 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 all day. <laughs> oh no, nah, man. But uh, I'm I'm glad you could join us. I still owe you that rematch, man. I'm still mad that you gave us 40 that game. Oh man, that was that was luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say hey, that. don't worry, Melvin <laughs> waiting to me 40. <laughs> Hey, when I, I used to play basketball, I don't play no more. I'm, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I got a. I'm supposed to play uh, Friday night, actually. So, um, y'all wish me luck. I'm out of shape, and I've been gaining the solid thirty pounds since COVID hit. Mm. So, um, y'all wish me luck Friday night. Um, hey, Target always has icy hot. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, last but certainly not least, um, so yeah, of the, the three guests that I have, I've met him most recently, maybe about a month, a month and a half ago. His wife is actually really close friends with um, my son's mom. And, you know, they both were like, you guys should connect because, you know, you guys are both the fathers of our children with autism. Y'all should connect. So, um, you know, she gave me his phone number. We ended up chatting, man, for like an hour. It turns out we were both big basketball fans. We both had a lot of common stories when they came to, you know, being autism fathers. And uh, when I when I came up with the idea for the episode, I couldn't, like, it was no second thought in my mind than to bring this brother on, man. He's a real good guy. Um, and I'm really looking forward to building a relationship with him moving forward. Um, huge basketball fan, too, just like y'all. Um, I don't know if he's still a player or not, but uh, um, he also not in Philly. I think he in Tennessee. I'm going to let him uh, <laughs> confirm that with me because this is an hour before – what a, like it's seven eleven here, six eleven where he at? So I'm really worldwide rushing with this one, man. So I'm gonna introduce my brother Terrell Mitchell. Terrell, what's going on, bro? Hey, it was good, y'all. How y'all doing? You in All Tennessee? Right. Right? Yes, yes, Tennessee, man, in the home of country music, Nashville, man. <laughs> the home of country music. <laughs> yeah, the Hollywood <laughs> of country music is what we call it, man. So yeah, yeah, anything to do with music, it goes down here. So yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, man, I have no idea that they call Nashville the home of country music. You learn something new every day. 
Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, we have the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame is here. Yeah, ah, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah, downtown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and for the record, I am, I'm retired with you, Melvin. So, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm on the sidelines. My knees will not allow it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my, <laughs> mind can process, my mind can process the game, but my body can't. So, yeah. <laughs> so, the yeah. recovery time ain't worth it. The recovery right. time is not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it. I'm pretty sure Buddy's older than both of y'all. He still play. Y'all should be ashamed of y'all stuff. Hey, man, maybe one day. I'll get out there and shoot. The shot's still there, but hey, I can't. I'm, played, I'm stationary. Uh, I'm stationary. I played on Monday. Oh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I look like they sound. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's been a minute. <laughs> no, man, but uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you guys could, uh, could, join, could join me tonight, man. Uh, before I go any further, let me get my, my, I guess, producer, for lack of a better term, my intern, my man, Hamid, behind the scenes, me, some love, man. Uh, we're having some tech difficulties on the computer for whatever reason. Whenever he tries to log in, it's freezing, but, you know, he's still here, you know, holding it down. Yeah, I mean, you know, he loves his plug. He's a real sharp kid, a real bright kid, and uh, I'm really glad that I get the opportunity to spend time with him um, when I do the show. So let's not beat around the bush here, guys, you know, like – um. One of you guys to just start with the first question, man. Just tell 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 the people your connection to autism. You know, um, how old is your kid? You know, when did your kid get diagnosed? You know, when did you start this uh, this journey as a parent of, of a child with autism? Uh, well, well, I'll, I'll go first. Um, uh, my my connection to autism. My son is six years old. Um, um, my, my journey started when he was about uh, about one one and a half. Um, we was taking him to daycare and. Um, one day a lady just pulled older lady. She just pulled me to the side and she said, Hey, I don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you if they want me to, but something just isn't, you know, registering with your son when we do activities, the way he's moving around, uh, when we do certain things. And so, um, after a while, me and my wife talked about it and, you know, you don't want anything to be wrong with your child. So we took him to the doctor. They say, Oh, he's fine. And, you know, we're kind of in, in the denial stage. And then, um, after a while, my mom starts to be around him and she used to own a daycare. And so she was like, yeah, I think you guys may need to go and get him checked out. And so we're like, no, nah, mom, we took him to the doctor, you know, blase, blase. Um, and then um, finally, um, when we took him to a different daycare, they were like, yeah, something he needs to be tested. And sometimes you may have to pressure the doctor to do so. Um, and so um, we did that and we got him tested at about one and a half, two years old. And um, that's when we got our diagnosis. And we've been um, fortunate here to um, roll with, um, uh, here in Vanderbilt and Children's Hospital has been great with us in terms of uh, early intervention um, programs and things like that. So um, that's my journey, and and we've been on it for the last uh, six years. Yeah, yeah. Mel, buddy. All right. All right. Um. So um, mine started. I think Malik was he was he was around two, and um he got sick, and we took him to the emergency room. Uh me and his mother and the doctor was saying that you know he he's not really responding to my questions and stuff um he's not really talking like like a normal kid would at this age um actually he was he was three he was he about to turn four and so um he he suggested that we take him to be tested and me and his mom was like well we don't think nothing wrong with him, but we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. And um, so she went and she took him to be tested. And of, of course, he um, he tested on the spectrum. And when she came home, like, I'll never forget that day because she was just crying, like, because they had told her all this stuff that he would never be able to do. And and like and just like Kenneth said, I was in denial, like, oh, there's nothing wrong with him. And he, he's all right. He talks to me. So that that's fine. And. That that's basically how how it, how it started off. And big, you yeah, um, my my uh, initial connection with it started a little different. My daughter was born at twenty six weeks. Um, she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Um, you know, not long after, she it was a lot of complications, and so she had to have a few eye surgeries. And I tell you, it was like probably one of the hardest journeys I ever had to deal with just in life in general. Um, you know, not only myself, but just, you know, a mom too, uh, more than anything. I'm grateful for her. I know, you know, we talked about 
you may mention Rush earlier about how parents, uh, dads don't normally get the recognition, but the way that, you know, her mother really stepped up and was just there for every single step of the way uh, when it came to understanding all of the medical terminology, um, what we needed to do to, you know, kind of really start to address the issue. Um, obviously, with her diagnosis, autism kind of fell like right in the midst of it all. So we pretty much, um, she was, you know, more so in denial um, than anything. Uh, once I realized that she was on the spectrum, I started really paying attention a lot more um, to what it meant, um, the different ways that, you know, we needed to be a part of that whole treatment process uh, from early intervention all the way through up until now, like she's 10. Um, and she's doing a, a, a hell of a job in school. Um, it's a little challenging sometimes, like dealing with the IEP and having them making sure that they're on top of it and she's getting the proper instruction and things of that sort. But the biggest thing for me, you know, that I learned more than anything else outside of the health side of it is that you have to be this child's big, biggest advocate pretty much for the rest of their life, um, especially now at this stage from, you know, your early detection, you know, all the way up through, I would say, adolescence up to this point. I haven't been that far yet, but... I mean, just from the journey that we've been on, just advocating for her repeatedly in so many different areas from education to Social Security to, you know, just the various different uh, levels of treatment that she needs. And when she's uh, beyond those uh, levels of treatment, like, you know, moving up to the next step. So um, I'm pretty sure, you know, it's a lot of similar stories that go around, but that's just, um, you know, a, a, a snippet, if you will, of my journey. Yeah, and, and for me, if you guys, I mean, most people are probably familiar with my journey, because I don't, you know, <laughs> the fact of it, but um, my son is 12. He just turned 12 on last Wednesday, actually, um, and he got diagnosed on, actually, on June 16th, 2011. My son was diagnosed with and, um, Like I said, you know, in the introduction, Melvin was the first person to, to reach out to me when I kind of, like, put it out there and was like, yo, call me, and he just pretty much was like, yo, it's going to be okay. Um, so he was the person that told me that um, Reese is nonverbal. Um, Reese is not fully potty trained yet, so he doesn't go in the bathroom with himself in public. But at home, he'll let loose. <laughs> um, and, uh, <laughs> um, he's also, as you saw in the video, man, that was Reese uh, at the beginning. That was my son. He's one of the sweetest kids you meet. His smile will light up a rim. And, um, and uh, it, it's a journey, and that's the best way I can put it. I actually had a poem that I wanted to play at the start, but because of the text, I'm not sure if I can play it. I can post it on the screen, but the, yeah, the lyrics, the words are too small to read. Um, but I'll try to post it up, and I'm going to read it, because um, before I go further, I just kind of want to put this out there, because there's a poem called Welcome to Holland by uh, Emily Pearl Nicely, and it just kind of talks about, you know, what it's like to have a child um, with autism, and it's really what helped me through my journey. So um, it says, you know, when you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and you make a, and you make wonderful plans. The Coliseum, the Michelangelo, David, the gondolas in Venice. You may learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives that you're about to go to Italy. You pack your bags all and off to go and off you go. Several hours later, the plane ends and the stewardess comes in and says, welcome to Holland. And you say, Holland? What do you mean, Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life, I dreamed of going to Italy. But there has been a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland, and there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks. You must learn a whole new language and you will meet a whole new group of people you would never have met. And it's not a bad place. It's just a different place. It's more slower paced than Italy, less flashy than Italy. But after you've been there for a while, you catch your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills and Holland has tulips and Holland even, even has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is coming and going from Italy. And for the rest of the life, for the rest of your life, you'll say, yeah, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, the very lovely things about Holland. And um, every time I meet a new parent of a child with autism, the first thing I do is send them that poem. 
And you might have missed the beginning because I know, you know, people typically only remember what they hear at the end. But like that very last line, if you spend the, your life more than the fact that you didn't get to Italy, if you spend your life more than the fact that your child is a neurotypical, if you, you spend a, uh, your, the rest of your life more than the fact that your child has a disability, you are unable to appreciate the beautiful things about Holland. You're unable to appreciate the beautiful things about having a child with autism, having a child with special needs. Now I don't know about y'all, Melvin and Terrell, but buddy, they wilding out in Philly, bro. Like, it was 500 murders last year, bro. They won't pace the past that this year. So when I think about when I think about being a parent of a child with autism, I'm like, I don't got to worry about him gangbanging. I don't got to worry about, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Him just having to be in the wrong street or anything like that. So that in itself true. is a huge relief for me as a parent, right? That's true. Um, so when I think about um, when I think about being a, a, a parent of autism early on, I think it's easy. And I heard you say it, you know, Terrell, early on when you were like, yeah, you know, at first I um, we were in denial. And that's I think that's yeah. part of the process, right? And I'm sure we'll get into that yeah. in this conversation. That's part of the process. But as you start to like look at your child, your son, your daughter, and um you start to say, like, man, like there's it's a beautiful journey that I'm on. And that's what I want to focus on today, you know, like that the beauty of this journey. Because I feel like oftentimes, and I'm sure you guys can attest to this, when people go to offer support, it's almost in a way to say, like, oh, things is going, it's going to be okay. Oh, your child's going to be all right. They might grow out of it. Things will get better. And for me, that's not my concern yeah. when it comes to him. I'm like, I'm fine with who Reese is because I know how many things I don't have to worry about if I had a neurotypical black son, right? So if I had a neurotypical black son in Philadelphia, in the hood in Philadelphia, like, <laughs> you imagine mm -hmm. like how, like I'd probably be a little worse off if you think about it, right? <laughs> so, you know, we got four black fathers here and we about to talk about what it's like raising black kids on the spectrum, right? So I'm really excited to do this. I'm really, really excited to do this. All right. So um let's go into the second question, guys. Um have you felt matter of fact, let's let's not go to the second one. Let's go to the fourth question. What are some of your fears as a parent of a child with autism? That's, a, that's a loaded question. That's a loaded question. <laughs> I, it it changes. It, it it changes as, as as they grow, because first it was how is Malik gonna be in school? Like, okay, so because my I, I didn't say it before. My son is seventeen now, um, and so like it's changed like with each level, like him going to school. Cause like, like I always tell people, I had the same fears that like other parents have. Like when your kid go to school, like how is he going to fit in? Like what kind of class is he going to get? Because as they get older, the teachers kind of leave them alone more, which is really sad. And like, like I remember telling Russ when he, he was talking about uh, Lil Reese, like make sure the teacher, you stay involved and connected with the teachers because, like, if you don't put in no effort, they're not going to do it either. But like, and now he's, he's 17. Like I, I'm, I'm, I, I think more about like his life. Like, what is he going to do now? Like, cause he, he's about to be an adult. He's going to graduate next year. Um, nice. and, and, and that's pretty much where I'm at now. Like, like what is his life going to be? Cause like he started doing little jobs. Like he worked at food line at the grocery store for a little while. Um, to to the corona hit, and that that's pretty much where I'm at now. Mm. Uh, yeah, I can echo that, uh, Melvin. Like, I, I that was my first thing. Like, you know, um, you know, you have this idea when you're gonna have kids. Like, especially for me, like, you know, I mean, I wanted a son. You know what I mean? So we can do all the things that you know I did as a kid. You know, go fishing. I'm ready to hoop with him. I'm ready to yeah. do all these things, and then. All of that gets halted with this. And then you realize he may not do that. You know what I mean? And that was a hard transition to me, a, a fear of like, dang, what is he, you know, what, what do I do now? I had all this idea and um, fearful, you know, of people taking advantage of him as he gets older and, and being naive to things. My son is nonverbal. Um, and so, you know, I fear like when he goes to school, the same. And we're very involved in his school. Like the teachers, principal, they know our faces. We're always yeah. in constant communication because, you know, I, he can't tell me. He can't come up and say, oh, we did this, that, and the third, right? 
or this right here happened to me. So I have to make sure that I'm involved as, as his father and as his, you know, me and my, me and my wife as his parents um, with him every step of the way, because you don't know and he can't tell us. So that, that was one of my fears. Like as he gets older, how, how does that work? And um, you know, as we've learned more about it, like the um, meltdowns and stuff like that, you know, how does that work as he gets older? So Melvin, I see you at his being 17. Does that, has that changed a little bit? Cause like my son is extremely strong. So in a meltdown, I'm like, man, I got to hit the gym. I got to get in the weight room. Because <laughs> when, when, when he start moving the table, I need to be ready. I need to be ready. <laughs> like, you know? at the, 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 as he's gotten older, like, he's become a lot more tolerable of, of certain things that as a kid, like, where it's just like, no. But the main thing with him, and, and it was the thing with him when he was little, is like, his routine once his routine gets broken like it really throws him off like if he goes to school and something is not where it's supposed to be or like or he wakes up in the morning and like something's not where it's supposed to be, like it is it throws him off like it'll mess up his whole day even from when he was a little kid like something simple as if i was the one to take him to school every day and his mom switched up like it would be a difference in his day. So routines, like, like whatever routines, but then you also want to, to be flexible with those routines because you want your kid to grow and like you want them to experience new things and, and teach them that sometimes things are going to be uncomfortable, but like you can get through it. If that makes any sense. It does. It does. And buddy, let me get you your, um, your, cause you're the only one with a daughter of us, right? So um, what are some of your fears and concerns? Just her um, her level of independence at a certain point. Like she's really, um, you know, a lot more high function um, than most. Um, so, but I also know that, you know, like when there's like, you know, Mel was just saying the routine change and things like that, like that triggers her a lot. Um, like every year we go through this in a new classroom at school. Um, I was fortunate that and and third and fourth grade, she had the same teacher um, in, in two different classrooms. So that helped out a lot. Um, I think the school identified that as well. So that was a um, sense of relief. They literally just went back to school last Monday in a physical form. Um, and she had a breakdown because this would be her first time in that school. She's in middle school now. Um, even though my, my son, my oldest son is there with her, you know, obviously they're in different classrooms. He's in a higher grade, but um, so she kind of had a breakdown just because she walked in that building and in the classroom for the first time, even though she's familiar with the teacher from Zoom calls. But so I just think that, you know, as she continues to get older, I'm just monitoring the fact that she's a lot more gaining a little bit more independence. But my biggest fear is that she won't be able to um, manage like on her own holistically as an adult. And more than anything, hmm. me not being around to be able to help her manage that process. Not that, you know, right. I'm in the streets and nothing like that, but, you know, just not, you know, being that, you know, just the, the fear of not being there, period. Um, or just not being alive, not, again, not like it's um, nothing detrimental to my health or anything like that, but if it makes any sense, that's just kind of like my biggest thing, just kind of being one of her strongest advocates and protectors. Yeah, and not, and not echo buddy sentiments for anyone watching that's wondering what my thoughts are. My biggest fear is, like, I'm, I'm, I'll am I'm be 33 this year. I'm in a city that they just had 500 homicides. Um, so my biggest fear is if something happens to me, if something happens to um, Reese's mom, like, what does his future look like? You know, like, have we uh, trained enough people around us up to kind of fill in seamlessly, you know what I'm saying, for, for his future? Um, have we done enough job of exposing him to other people? Have um, what his look like so that when I think of um, my biggest fear, that's what it is. It's no longer well, you know, am I doing enough? Because like I, I think that um, for a while, and I heard you say this, Sorrell, For a while, I feel like I was projecting a lot of my expectations on him. So a lot of my disappointment came from me being like, oh, I want to shoot hoops with you. Oh, I want to play video games with you. Oh, I want to do this with you. But once you kind of get over that, that it's kind of like, all right, well, I'm 33 and I'm in a city where, like, people are dying just for, like, honking your horn at somebody who don't drive at a green light. Like, what happens if I beat at somebody who don't go go at a green right. light and they shoot me? Like, 
then what does life look like after that, right? Um, and even, you know, as my son transitions into puberty, he's 12 now. So as he transitions into puberty, for me, it's like, if you if you ever seen my son's mom, she's about five nothing, if that. Like, that might be being generous. So my son's about the same size as her now when he's 12. So it's kind of like, well, what if, you know, he's out with her and he has a meltdown when he's like 16 and he's like five seven five eight. 150, 160. Like, what does it look like for her, you know, in that instance? So what that has done for me is it's kind of lit a fire in my behind to say, you have to get to a point where, you know, you can be there more often. And, I, you know, I'm not married to my son's mom anymore, so I don't have that, uh, the same household thing like you, Terrell. Um, but it's like you have to get to a point where, you know, you can be more present. You can be with you more often because – or for being there, out there and there's a meltdown when he's 16, 17, and he's like the same size as me. The doctor said he's going to be 5'9. I'm about six foot, even maybe about 185, 190 now, and she's about like five, even maybe 120. So even if he grows to the 5'9, like the doctor said he's going to be, and he's like 5'9, 160, 170, what she's going to do with that if he's mad and he's attacking her? Right. What is she going to do? Like nothing. So, you know, like, that's, that's true. my biggest fear, you know, when it comes to being the parent of a of a child with autism. What does his future look like, and what am I am I doing enough? I should say to yeah. to make his future as as easy as possible. Um, yeah, just to just, to, like just to echo one thing, man. Um, something that you said, like you know, uh, I fear that I didn't mention was just him being able to talk to me. Like you know what I mean? Just to be able for him to just communicate with me. It it it. It's something that, you know, that's hard for me because it's like I but I still what I do is I still talk to him as if he's going to respond. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I never I always just, you know, talk to him. Hey, how was school today? I mm -hmm. do it just, you know, because I'm hoping at some point because he can generate words that it just kind of registers like, OK, yeah, he's asking me. And it's some of that routine uh, that we all are talking about in terms of, hey, man, maybe he can give me a one word, two word answer eventually. So. That, that was one of my things, like his communication and like, you know, how do I navigate that and how will I be taking care of him going forward if if he, if that never comes, you know? Yeah, and likewise, right? So I pray with my son whenever, you know, he's with me. And before we pray, the first thing I say, I say, do you want to start off in praying? And he looks at me and I look at him. And he looks at me and I look at him. That's it. Okay, no problem. I'll pray. <laughs> But I do that every time, you know, and they told us maybe three years ago. No, he's 12. So five years ago, actually, when he turned seven, they said, typically, if, if kids with autism haven't started talking about seven, they will start talking. And they told us that. And I cried. I didn't tell anybody that. I just sat in the house by myself and cried a little bit. And I said, OK, well, cool. I'm just going to have a nonverbal kid. <laughs> and kept it pushing. So um, that that's kind of how I handled it. It probably wasn't the healthiest way to handle it. So if you guys had get that conversation at some point, buddy, Terrell, Melvin, when he gets his internet uh, right, if you get that conversation, I don't recommend you just crying by yourself and keeping it pushing because it's probably an unhealthy way to deal with things. But that's how I dealt with it. Um, and yeah. that, that's kind of what happened. For me. Yeah, I, I feel you on that, man. Like I, I did that. I, I'm like, well, I, I haven't cried about it yet, but I, I'm, I'm watching the clock. Every year <laughs> goes by. I'm, you know what I mean. I'm like, I'm on. You know, like man, he's six years old. You know, okay, how many words is he saying? Is he drink? You know, you know, he's about to be seven. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly watching that. Like, hey, in twelve months, like, what, where do we go from there? And you know, sometimes. You know, it can still happen. And so I just have to, um, you know, have faith in that. One of my cousins, he's a special ed teacher back home in Alabama. And um, he was encouraging to me like, hey, man, I ha I've seen thousands of kids in my 10 year. And he was like, I've had kids not talk until they're 12, 13, 14 years old. And now they talk all the time and they have jobs. Um, and so that was just encouraging, like, you know, and that's why, you know, I wanted to talk to you guys who have older kids, uh, especially Melvin, like having 17, like, what is that like? How how did you, how are you navigating that? Because that's one of my fears, like, he's so strong, like, if he grabs somebody or if I, I, I was reluctant to put him in, like, karate or something like that, so I'm like, man, if he really just wanted to hurt somebody, you know, he really could because if he had some meltdown because he would know how to protect himself. But I also want him to be able to protect himself. Because, uh, you know, there are bullies and people out there and kids that are going to be kids, you know what I mean? And um, but I just want him to be able to protect himself and just be like, hey, man, I'm going to give you all you can handle if you come over here. So 
Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll connect you. I know a guy. His name is Jason Henderson. He does karate up in DC. Um, but I'll connect you with him. He does karate specifically for special needs kids. I'll connect you with him after the show, Terrell. Sure. Um, just thank, thank you. The people's brain about that. Um, buddy, you got something to say? I saw you took yourself on mute. Oh no, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm oh, just, right. I'm just listening. Um. So um on on the note of uh, being a father of a child with autism, I don't know what's going on with Melvin's internet right now, but um, how how have you guys felt supported on this fatherhood journey? Have you guys felt felt supported by your spouses? Have you felt supported by your family? Have you felt felt mentally, emotionally supported at all? For me, um, no. It's kind of been. You know, on and off. Um, like I said earlier, obviously, mom is there. She's been there since day one, like, from a supportive standpoint. Um, but I think that's kind of, you know, pretty much about the extent of it, to be honest. Um, you know, my daughter has an aunt that is really, really, really in tune with all of the um, aspects of autism. And, you know, she knows how to communicate with her in a, a very different way um, that, you know, she makes her feel comfortable and has such, has done such since day one. Um, so, you know, when she's able to talk to her and have conversations and, um, you know, just kind of spend that, that, that time of comfort, I've never seen her upset in front of her before, um, which was a, a huge plus. Um, so just, you know, from a means of support in that regard, you know, um, a lot of, you know, you got a lot of family members and, and friends that hey, know sorry her, about that, her situation, but it's not like um, we really pushed or, or kind of put it out to have folks um, kind of really be as involved. It's, it's just more so, you know, from a family aspect, like siblings and, you know, just us as parents for the most part. Um, so obviously outside, you get a few uh, realms of support from the um, different agencies and stuff like that. But I really wouldn't even consider that as much support, you know, unless you're dealing with somebody that will go above and beyond the scope of service um, just based on, you know, their liking this for your child or just it, their job, if you want to call it that. Um, so for us, it's a little bit different, but it's, you know, kind of, it's, it's to be expected up to this point. I just feel like for us as parents, um, we're, like I said before, supposed to be our main advocates and supporters. So we won't really look at too much outside of that other than what we feel as though we advocate for her. For, um, and, and that would be about the extent of it. Right. Um, Remember, while you were out, we asked, uh, how, how do you feel supported, you know, by your family, friends, emotionally, mentally? Do you feel supported uh, throughout this journey? Um, truthfully, and, and like, it, it's sad to say I've. It, it's, it's certain people in the family who, who really like because autism, if you don't read up on it, you don't know what it is. And so. Whether than take the time to get to know Malik, they just they back away. Mm. And like I've received like there's certain family members that go above and beyond, like especially like on my my son's mother's side, like they go above and beyond. Like they they've always tried to make Malik feel included. And like um, as far as like teachers and stuff, like I said, um, I, I think it was buddy who said his his son had i mean his daughter had the same class like we actually had the, we were lucky enough where his first through the fourth grade he was in two different classrooms and that was it he had the same teachers for two years and they supported us like even to this day they still reach out to us um but as far as like he, he's we're supported as far as like people who like Maurice, I, I've reached out to him, but as far as family, like sadly, I can't say that my family has supported him as much as they should have, or w I would have liked them to. And um, Terrell, I'll let you take that, but I do kind of want to add, like, I guess a B, a one B to it. <laughs> um, but like the one B to the question would be like, so what Melvin said, I wholeheartedly. Everything that Melvin just said, I agree with about my family, where it's like there are certain members who are all the way there in the trenches. There are certain members who I feel like don't understand autism, so they kind of step back. Um, but the one B to that question for you, Terrell, is do you feel like that's on them or do you feel like that's on you to kind of say, here's how you deal with my child. Here's how you talk to the child. Um, like 
because that's like initially I think I felt the same way Melvin did. I was like, dang, yo, like no one checks on me. No one asks can they babysit Reese. Like no one reaches out to me. Like it's just me and Reese. And then more recently I've been kind of like, well, what have I done for my family members to say, here's how you deal with Reese. Here's what triggers Reese. Here's what might set him off. You know, my family is really one that gets together all the time, typically around holidays and birthdays are typically when we see each other. And like milestone birthdays. So like you're talking about like your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. So that's typically when my family are seeing each other. So with that infrequency, um, have I done a good enough job in between, you know, holidays and birthdays or graduations and things like that of, of training them? Um, so kind of take, take this question. Have you felt supported? And then do you feel like you've done a good enough job of kind of mm -hmm. training people around you um, to do so? Um, feeling supported. I, I, I mean, I feel supported to a degree. Like, you know, I think I feel like you guys feel a little bit in that. Like, I think my wife is tremendous, um, as being like a, a, a supportive partner, um, you know, with me, like she's one of the most positive people, uh, that you'll ever want to meet. You know what I mean? So she's always trying to find a solution to it. Even when we have those long nights or those hard times, you know, she's always just trying to work, you know, to be better for him, um, for family. Um, I mean, I think initially, you know, our parents, they, they, you know, when he was smaller, I think they took it on a little bit more because he was a little bit more easier. And then I think as he got older, I think it became a little bit difficult for them because our parents are a little bit older. My mom's a little bit older. Her mom's a little bit older. So, um, you know, it's only so much that they can do. And it's so much for them to absorb, like, you know, between the meltdown, some of them, it makes them emotional. Like, man, I can't see him go through that. Or, you know, they don't understand why does he keep doing this repetitive thing, you know, where he keeps hitting the wall or he keeps jumping up on this or that. And I'm like, well, this is, I'm bringing you into our world. Now it's up to you to, coming here and learn what we do to kind of distract him or redirect him to do that. And that way, now when we're not here, we go to the store or something like that. You'll know how to redirect him. You'll know how to uh, calm him down or you'll know what he needs and look for those particular signs. Um, friends. I do have some friends, man. I, you know, two people I grew up with that, you know, my homeboys, they, you know, they've been uh, great support systems for me in terms of just somebody that I can just, you know, just reach out to. Um, but I do, as far as like babysitting, yeah, no, it's not anybody just calling like, hey, you know, we'll, we'll watch it. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you you notice, you know, how people start to treat you, you know, before it's like, ah, oh, you know, it's, it's included. Like, oh, yeah, let's come to the birthday party. Then as it gets older, it starts to be like, well, you know, nobody's coming to the birthday party. It's just us. Or, you know, nobody's inviting us to come to it because it's just us. And he may not interact with the kids. And that's one thing that I've seen because he's nonverbal, he can't make those connections with the kids. So now when they're making out the list of, oh, I want Jimmy and Joey, you know, all these people to come, he's not going to be there because he can't make that connection with them in that way verbally to, to, to say, hey, I, I, you know, I like you or I want to be your friend or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so I definitely, it's something that's a struggle and I think it's just going to be a struggle that we have. Like, you know, it's just us here in Nashville. Um, and, you know, I have I cut some family members who will, you know, that are here as well, who have volunteered to, to watch him as well. And I think that the part B of your question is I, I, I need to get out of myself a little bit more, too, because I don't feel like we've tried to train certain people. and It just hasn't gone over well. But I think I need to be more open to letting people do it because I'm so afraid of, hey, you know, are you going to watch him like we watch him? Are you going to you know, you have to pay yeah. close attention. You can't just let him go upstairs and say. Hey guys, I'm gonna come get y'all when the food is ready. Like, nah, because he will be jumping off your balcony somewhere, or mm -hmm. you know, he may grab your kid, or he may break something because he wants to play with stuff that is not typically, you know, typically kids don't play with, or you can tell them, hey, don't do that, and it's done. You know, um, so that's kind of been the struggle for us. It's like, hey, how do we find that balance of hey, I want to teach you um to kind of bring them into our world and then having them wanting to learn it and me being open and pushing that a little bit more to get more of that help um is is a little bit of a struggle because you're expecting hey you're we're family why aren't you just doing it because you're family i let your kids come over or when i didn't have kids i watched your kids and they came over mm -hmm. and all that stuff mm -hmm. you know I, i'm just looking for the reciprocal of it now that that nothing more nothing less and i'm not asking you to watch them all night because i know you can't do it but if, Two or three hours, give me two or three hours, four hours. I'm a simple man. Like, just give me a few hours to be by myself, play the game, watch a game, you know, whatever the case may be, whatever I like to do on my own, in my own time, and and I'll be good, you know. So that that's the main thing for me. And, and 
with with the part B of your question, I, I actually agree with both of y'all because, like, your natural reaction is to like. At first, you're like, okay, I want to protect them. I want to protect them. I, 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 if they're not going to keep watch them like I watch them, then he's safer with me. But and, and like you said, Maurice, sometimes you got to be like, hey guys, um, I'm gonna bring Malik over for a little bit and like let him hang out and stuff. Because like, at, once he got to a certain age, we kind of just was like, okay, well, nobody's gonna interact with him. We'll, we'll, we'll do stuff with him ourselves, or, or we'll find other ways to keep him entertained. Which, which in the long term, is it, it, not not the ultimate solution you want to do. So, so now mm -hmm. we're at this stage where we're trying to get him to be more socially, because I think my son is the only one out of all of us who, who is verbal. Like Malik is verbal. Like he just he says inappropriate things sometimes or, or awkward things, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The sundress story. I <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> no, but uh so uh, kinda I'll I'll say this statement that I'll segue into the next thing. Cause I think what happened with me, right? When Reese was little, I heard so many things like, oh, there's nothing wrong with him, or oh, just go ahead, he just needs a spanking, or oh, just drop him off with me for a weekend. I bet you he be talking or he'll be acting right, you know, by Monday. And I heard so much of that when he was like one, two, or three, then then he's, you know, 10, 11, 12. I'm kind of like, man, I'm not trying to deal with nobody because when he was little and I was really in it, that's all I heard, right? Was Man, just leave him with me. I'll whoop him up a couple of times. Or leave him with me. I bet you we be talking. Or oh, my niece, cousin, best friend. You know she wasn't talking either. And you know they she stayed the weekend with me. And by Monday she was potty trained and talking and everything. And I think people say that stuff to you and they think they're helping, but they're not doing nothing, nothing. to help you when they say those things. <laughs> so whoever's watching this, that's one thing I'll put out there. If your niece, cousins, best friends, aunt stayed with you for a weekend and they left talking. Don't say that to me, sis. Don't say that to me, bro, because that's not going to help me for where I am in my journey. But I think that now that he's of age, well, now that he's at this age now, and honestly, Reese is really low maintenance. So, like, Reese isn't like your son's bro. Yeah. Like, you don't touch him. All Reese want to do is make sure his tablet is charged and his YouTube is working and eat every yes. hour. <laughs> like, as long as he got food and as long as YouTube working, Reese is good. He'll be out your space. Give him a quiet room. You got to check on him because he'll go to the bathroom on himself when he's indoors. But outdoors, like, he'll go find a quiet corner and be fine. Or he'll just sit in my car. And I'll park somewhere where I can still see him in the car and be at the event. And I'll just glance back, like, every 10 minutes. That's where he is now. But when he was, like, one, two, three, and he was kind of in more of that exploring age, people weren't saying the right thing. So I think I'm wary now. Um, is that something you guys agree with, buddy? Is that something that you agree with? Yeah, wholeheartedly. My um, my daughter, you give her YouTube, um, you give her her phone. Um, she is a, a gamer, a gamer, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, she, you know, she follows behind her brother a lot, so she will play. You know, try to play Fortnite, try to play Minecraft. Um, so she, um, I have two sons, so one of my sons is like huge, like really, really, really in the game. Um. And they really get along. So, I mean, I guess going back to that support, they are like her biggest advocates. My sons are um, one is uh, 11, the other one is 12. And they are like her biggest advocates. My 12 year old son, um, Buddy, he really looks out for her and tries to make sure that he does everything that she, he feels like she may need. But he also kind of has a different level of understanding as to being able to help her understand that some of this stuff you have to do yourself. So he's kind of like gotten into a space, um, you know, being as though we're training with mom, he's you know, kind of making sure, like I said, she may, he'll check on her. Did you wash up yet? Um, did you finish? Did you forget to put the odorant on? Things like that. You know, just random questions. Um, my other son, he is just like her best friend. You know, he plays with her all the time. Every time I look up when they're together, they are <laughs> together. Um, you know, like from Legos to Minecraft to wrestling to YouTube, um, they talk about pretty much everything over the phone um, through text message. You know, so like I said, She's a little more high functioning, so she's able to do a lot of those things. And even seeing sometimes some of the words that she uses when she sends me 
text messages is just I'm like, is the phone spelling this or is it her? But either way, you know, just the level of expression, you know, I can appreciate it because at one point I wasn't so sure that she was, you know, really comprehending well um, or just even hearing us. But again, you get her into a space where she's content. Um, she likes certain movies like, you know, everybody mentioned routine. Um, she gets into her routine. and If she's into it, she hates to leave the house unless she knows she has some sort of appointment um, or something that may be, you know, valuable to her health uh, being explained by mom. She is usually uh, a homebody. She loves being in the house, yeah. loves her space, her room, oh, wow. um, kind of, you know, change it and put it into like an apartment style almost. She has a little couch in there now. So she really doesn't even need to come out the room unless it's time to eat. And, and you barely see outside of that. <laughs> and she's comfortable. Hey, that's yeah, that's yeah. Malik, buddy. L like my son does the same thing. He, he he even when I go over to visit him, like today I went by to visit him. He came downstairs, gave me a hug. Hey, he actually had his wallet in his hand because he thought I was gonna give him some money. But um, after that, he ran back upstairs, got back on his laptop and his tablet, and just left me downstairs. Like it, it's not your day to come visit. Like you you breaking my routine. I got YouTube to watch. Oh uh, yeah, see my son, he's still in that exploring and all that. So he is ready to be outside. He wants to climb. He wants to jump. Um, we we have a a, a second story, you know, a little loft area. He gets up on the on the ledge of it and leans down into the stairwell. And I'm like, man, he's gonna fall. So I have to like stay up there and watch him. But he's he's more. He likes to be out. He likes to be on the go. Him and mom, they go down and they'll go all day, and he loves it. Um, still doesn't get tired. But you know he's had a good time, and 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 that's the that's like the main thing for him. But, um, but yeah, yeah, I did, <laughs> I do. Um, um, wish he was a little bit more quiet and a little bit more toned down because he is everywhere. <laughs> that kid is everywhere, man. Yo, yo, I tell people all the time, Reese is the loudest nonverbal kid you'll ever meet. Oh my gosh, I'll be like, Reese, you don't talk. Why are you so loud, bro? <laughs> Cause he does a lot of yelling and a lot of grunting, and I'll just be like, "Bruh, like, okay, I get it." Like, he, um, I had to, <laughs> here's how I knew he went to the bathroom at home. I'll be sitting here like watching TV, and I'll just hear, mm, mm, and I'll be like, "Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh my gosh it's stupid!" And I walk back there, and I'll just be like, "All right, come on, son, let's get cleaned up." <laughs> oh, yep, no. yep. You you no. know those noises, yeah, yeah. I know those noises. Right. I know the angry when you're about to damage something. I'm I'm running downstairs like, hey, let me grab you for you. You know, punch a hole in the wall or something. Like, right. let me get you. <laughs> you know, I know I know when he didn't. You know, about to potty on himself. Yeah, I know those noises for real. Yeah, all day. Uh, and then the thing about it is, you you go places and see. I've been more cognizant of that. When you go places, people used to look at. You know how you used to. You know, when you're younger, you look, why is he screaming or why are they, you know, acting that way? And I'm more cognizant of that now because I'm like, okay, my son does that. And people look at us right. and we, you know, he done smacked and pulled and kicked and all kinds of things, man. And you didn't, then you realize, okay, maybe it was something wrong. And it's not that they're just being yeah. bad because, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Because that, that's, that, that was my parents. Like, all you, all he needed is some discipline that y'all just don't, y'all don't discipline them enough. I'm, uh, and whooping, I'm like, well, whooping is not going to, do anything for him because he doesn't understand trouble and that and, the seriousness of that, you know, so hitting him in, or, you know, spank, giving him spanking is not going to be the way you're going to have to use the techniques we're giving you that we're being taught in all these therapy sessions we're paying for and, and utilize that, you know, until he has that certain understanding. So. Yeah. And I agree wholeheartedly. And I think that that's where, so when I always think of like this term autism awareness, right. That we throw out so often um i see people all the time fighting and arguing about uh, uh all the puzzle pieces offensive to people with autism or autism speaks doesn't do enough for people with autism i see stuff like that all the time online and all i can say is like when i think of autism awareness i don't think of a certain entity i don't think of a certain business i think about man if i spread autism awareness that means when i go to the restaurant next, next thursday with my son people won't be looking at me like i'm crazy that means to me, if I go to Clementon Park and I tell that employee there, you know, our Six Flags, our Dorney Park, or with a Bush Gardens for y'all in the South, um, when I go to that amusement park and six I tell them, oh, oh, yeah, right. six <laughs> okay. when I tell them that in the South, autism awareness looks like to me, me saying, oh, he has autism, and them not looking at me like I'm crazy. That means I can show up to church on Sunday morning 
in half the congregation isn't looking at me like shush them or take them out the service. Like that's what autism awareness means to me, right? So when I thought about this episode, that's what I thought about what we can do, you know, like we can spread awareness about what autism really looks like and what it really looks like, you know, to be a father of a child with autism. Um, because I think so often people automatically either default to what you guys were saying, oh, just whoop it out of them or oh, leave it to me and they'll grow out of it. Or they go to the complete opposite of, well, oh my gosh, you must be so depressed because your child has autism. Let me offer you some encouraging words. And it's like, no, there's a very huge population of people who aren't like, who's just very much in the middle. Like, I'm okay with my son's diagnosis at this point, yeah. but I'm also not about to, you know, whip it out of them or nothing like that or act like it doesn't exist. Like, my concern is, like, have I trained enough people up around me? Like, I remember one of my good friends, Melvin Buddy, y'all know Wap, my, uh, my homie yeah. Wap, one time he was over my, my apartment, and uh, <laughs> I was like, yo, Wap, I'm about to go to the Chinese store to pick up this yeah. food. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, do you want to see somebody who's a Chinese store to get pick up this food? I was only going to be going for, like, 20 minutes. He was like, no problem. I leave to pick up the Chinese food. I come back, Reese in a bag of chips. And I say, hey, Wap, man, we know he wasn't supposed to eat a bag of chips before dinner. He was like, oh, he came and hand me a bag of chips. I just opened it for him. And I'm like, oh, he finessed you, bro. And like, in those moments, I say, see, like, people think, like, when they hear autism, they think uh, 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 mentally challenged uh, or things like that. Like, it's nothing wrong with the way that he thinks. Like, because he darn sure finessed my homie out of an extra bag of chips before dinner. Because he knew darn well if I was there, he wouldn't have got an extra bag of chips. And there are instances like that where I know, like, all right, I don't need to treat Reese that much different is there some patience involved yes is there some repetitive you know communication involved yes do i need to keep pictures of his favorite things in the refrigerator yes but when it comes to communication he also understands a lot right so like his birthday was coming up on his talking device literally all april he kept hitting birthday birthday easter birthday all throughout march and i'm like you know your birthday is coming up like he wasn't saying anything after that and i think when people understand how intelligent how intelligent children with autism are and how slick that like my, my, my daughter is four years old. She's very neural. She, my daughter is neurotypical and my daughter probably gives me a harder time <laughs> than my son does. My four year old man. I'll be like, whoo. And buddy, I know you got a five piece. So uh, <laughs> I know you can talk about what it's like to have, you know, kids that aren't on a spectrum or kids, you know, without a disability and how, like they probably give you a harder time than your daughter do, don't they? Yeah, yeah, for sure, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so like, like that's how it is with children on the spectrum. It's like they absolutely give you, you know, like they're easier in some instances, but like children that's not on the spectrum, man. Like, there's so many things that you don't have to worry about when you have a child with autism, and that's the point. Part that I think people miss at that initial diagnosis, right? Like that's the part that you miss. So I think when 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 you're sitting in front of that developmental pediatrician, right, and she comes in the room with them results, and she's like, "Yeah, your child has autism." You immediately go to everything you had planned for that child's life yeah. that they won't be able to do. That's immediately yeah. where your mind goes to everything. Immediately, you had, mind, let, let me let me say that everything you had planned. Not everything they had planned for themselves, everything you had planned for that child to do that they won't be able to accomplish. That's immediately where your mind goes to. And then after a while, you're like, this ain't so bad after all. You know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't so bad after all. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's different. Like, like the poem said, it's less flashy. It's not, you know what I'm saying? It's not as many people in this lane of parenthood. But yeah. it's also beautiful in its own regard, and it takes for you to be in it. And I can tell that yeah. from the comments that people say to me, that it takes for you to be in it, to see the beauty in what it is to be raising a child with special needs. Yeah, I, um, I totally agree with that, man. I agree. Yeah. Um, like, go ahead. Go ahead, Mel. Uh, I, I was just going to say, like, like you said, like Malik, like I think about like the stuff that other kids, other parents have to do. Like, like Malik has always been like the most inexpensive, like, hey, you want to go do something? Let's just go walk around the mall. Let's go to the mall, get a cookie. 
go to Chick-fil-A, ride the elevators, come home. That's all he want to do. Hey, you want to go bowling? No, um, let's just go go get something to eat. Let's go to Chick-fil-A. You want to sit inside Chick-fil-A and eat? No, let's just go home. Like, like I always tell people, like, he's so low, low maintenance. I, I mean, but now when he is at home, like you said, every hour he's going to eat. <laughs> every hour he's going to eat. All right. <laughs> He'll eat you in the poorhouse, bro. <laughs> like his, his, his mom would call me. His mom would call me and be like, "Hey, um, yeah, Malik wants to eat Chinese food." And I'd be like, "What? Did not give him give him his allowance?" And she'll be like, "Oh, he went through that already." Oh man, that's tough. That's tough. It is. It's heavy. All right. Um, I, I think we lost, buddy. But um, I do want to ask this question to you guys: How do you guys feel? Um. You can be better supported in this journey, you know, as a as a father of a child with autism. Man, for me, I, for me, I think it's just just people being accepting of it. Like, you know, you don't have, you know, it's like you said, it's going to take a little bit more patience. You know, take a little bit more attention, um, but just include them. Just include them. You know what I mean? When we go places, like you know, just know, hey, we're we're there. You know, to, at the birthday party, just know he's not going to do things that typical kids do. Just let him. But let them be a part of the the thing, and you never know what may happen. Because that's one of my things. Like, um, you know, we thought about having other kids, and that that was one of my reservations. Like, man, do I want another kid? What's the potential of him having autism? And I have now I have two. And what does that look like? You know, I, that that's one of my fears. And the people here at uh, Vanderbilt, we did like all kinds of testing with Autism Speaks and Vanderbilt and DNA stuff that help you kind of. Um, figure out the percentage, you know, that they can do with these tests, like, you know, of you trying to have one to try to ease that pain. So I do um, recommend people do stuff like that. I don't want to get in people's business like that, but I do recommend, like, if you're thinking about having it, you're planning to having it, um, you know, because it's not for everybody. It's not for the weak, you know, it's not for the weak at, uh, or faint, you know, so, you know, you know, I feel like God gave them to me because, for a reason, because he know I'm going to take care of them. And I think for y'all the same, like, cause there's some kids they don't have, whether they're, you know, um, uh, on the spectrum or not that, you know, don't, don't have good parents. So um, I just try to, um, you know, just, just having people be more accepting of them and then just check on me, just check on me. Hey, you need something. Hey, you know what I mean? I'm just checking on y'all. Hey, you want me to come by and just, you know, for a couple hours and just, you know, watch them while y'all go, go in the backyard, go upstairs and take a nap, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? I think that's how I can just be better supported. And then for me also just uh, reciprocating that and reaching out to people and saying, Hey, I need you to just come over and watch them instead of making it, you know, putting the whole thing on them to make that move. So oh, that's heavy. No. And I, I, I was going to mirror what he said. Uh, Malik doesn't live with me. And I mean, so what he said, I know his mom w would say that. And if he lived with me, I because even when he does is with me, there's times where Malik is a lot like, and, and it would be nice if somebody be like, Hey, um, come get Malik for a while or like just or or even ask questions like hey how's Malik doing uh, is there anything I can help you with Malik or something like that yeah and I, I echo what both of you guys are saying that's the biggest thing so I, I, if anyone's watching this and they're thinking well man what can I do for a father of a child with autism the biggest thing is take that step in getting to know the kid right so I think that Oftentimes, and I can even think about myself when I met people, even as a father or before a father of a child with autism who has special needs kids, I'm typically the step away guy. Like, uh, well, whatever. Like, I don't want to go down that road. Like, I don't really want to learn the intricacies or whatever. But just take that next step. Get to know the kid. Um, get to yeah. understand the kid. Um, ex the parent, parent. I remember one time, um, one of my one of my friends was having a birthday party. And they invited me, and I was like, I ah, least, you know, he doesn't really like large crowds, so I'm probably not going to be And yeah. they were like, well, you know, what does he like to eat? I can set up a quiet room for you. Like, things like that was That's the awesome. way to me. I'm like, wow, like, you invited me to a party, and you're telling me that you're going to set up a quiet room for me to go sit in, and you're going to put like stuff on the menu that he likes to eat. Nice. Like, that's major to me. So when I think about how you can be supported, it's just people kind of taking that next step, right? To yeah. say like, okay, cool. I see that it's difficult. I know that it's, I know how difficult it is where raising a quote unquote neurotypical child, right? So right. your journey as a child 
us as a parent of a child with autism has to be even that much more difficult, right? So what can I do to alleviate that load? Okay, I understand. And it's a big thing for anybody listening. I understand you may not trust me with him. I understand that because he doesn't communicate. So he can't come back and say, oh, well, I was with Miss So-and-so or I was with Aunt So-and-so or I was with Grandma So-and-so and we did blah, 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 blah. The, co- the kid with autism can't tell you that. So like when I think of who I'm going to drop resolve, these have to be people who I trust that will do the right thing by you. Um, so I would I would also add to that educate like educate like you know go and read up on what what it is go and read about it learn about the condition because we I think we've all said it at some point you know they just oh he'll grow out of it or be you know yeah. it doesn't work it doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. This is this is a life journey that they that they're on, and so you need to if you're going to be in our lives, you need to just educate yourself about it. Um, you know, my my mother-in-law in um, in Alabama, she started going. They had classes there, and she started going to the classes to learn about you know potty training and his sleep habits and his eating and how to deal with uh, meltdowns, and it and it really helped her really kind of understand, okay, y'all going through a lot. Like this is a lot. You know, she saw the packets and she was like, oh, this this is you know, this is a lot. And so it, it kind of shed a light on her and made her kind of understand and, and be like a little bit more uh, empathetic towards us. and like, okay, I do need to help out more because now I see all the things that you guys have to kind of try to manage with them. So. Right. And I think that just understanding that fatigue, right. And I posted something on my Facebook page a few months ago and it was just like, yeah, I understand if I show up somewhere looking tired, if I show up somewhere and I'm just like, or matter of fact, if I don't show up to something, like, if you plan something, Man. I'm like, yeah, I'm not you got to understand that, right? Don't give me hell if I don't show up to to something that it's really something that I would prefer to do. But on that particular day, if I got a babysitter, there's some times where my mom might be like, oh, I'll watch Reese go in and go to that event. Then I get home and I'm like, wait, Reese not here. I'm chilling so I can go out or I can sit at home and just enjoy a quiet night. Sorry, bitch. Sorry, night at the bar. Sorry, day at the restaurant. I'm just going to enjoy this quiet time tonight. But, like, I think you got to mm-hmm. understand that, right? And, like, I don't want to wake up, you know, if I do it tonight's Wednesday. If I do it tonight, I don't want to wake up Thursday morning to, dang, man, why you ain't show up? Dang, man, I thought you said she was coming. Like, understanding that the the me time, the alone time is very few and far in between. Fewer and further in between than if you had a neurotypical child, right? So understanding yeah, that, yeah. I think that that's a big thing that you can do to support and not giving somebody grief. And like I said, the biggest thing is just, like you said, educating yourself, understanding the struggle and just taking that step to say, well, what can I do to be supportive yeah. of you in, in this journey? Buddy, we were asking about what you can do to be better supported in this journey. Um, I think if anything, it's kind of pretty much the same thing you said. It's just time, like just being able to have that time to relax and, and just kind of gather your own thoughts for a little bit. Um, and like, you know, I, I, somebody mentioned earlier, I believe it was Melvin just mentioned earlier, just like, you know, being able to play the game, watch the game, um, just find time to do some things that you don't necessarily have to worry about anything at all because you have that level of support or that means support that um, the folks that you're tr- entrusting your child with, you know they're going to give you as close to the level of care as possible um, that you will. So and and that's almost impossible, right? But at the same time, you know, just being able to have that little bit of time frame that you can get, um, even if it's the twenty minute walk to the Chinese store or a time frame, you know, within that, you know, you just want to make sure that it gives you that little bit of time to be able to, like I said, just gather your support. I mean, yeah, we all ride the word, um, come home, but you know, other life stresses is always on your mind in that regard. So, um, and even sometimes just being able to go to and from coming back, you aren't about if your child's in school, if they're okay, um, things of that nature. So, you know, even during the times that they may be in school, you either at work or if you might have a day off um, while they're still in school, that still isn't that same level of comfort that you would get if they were in their own house and you just had somebody there that was responsible enough to go check and make sure that they're still okay in their spots of routine and comfort. Yeah. And that's and that's major. Um, and this is from Kelly. Kelly um, puts a comment up. Getting to know them is important. She's actually a, a behavioral therapist um, down in Atlanta. Um, so she works with children mm-hmm. with uh, autism in the ABA center. Um, she says getting to know them is important. All children with autism are not the same. 
educate yourselves, but be open to learning their likes and dislikes. And I think the biggest thing from this comment is all children with autism are not the same. So that goes back to the statement I made of people saying, oh, my sister's aunt nephew has autism, or oh, my cousin's best friend mom has autism, or oh, you know, this person, just because, you know, like, look at, just look at this chat alone, you know what I'm saying? There's four dads and children with autism at four different Mm -hmm. points of the spectrum, you know what I'm saying? Like, Melvin said his son's uh, verbal, Buddy's daughter has, you know, autism and cerebral palsy. Um, Me and Terrell, we're at um, different stages. Um, Like, I mean, like, our sons are probably about, it sounds like our sons are at roughly the same level, but we're still at different stages. Like, his son is six, my son is 12. So there's some things that, you know, my son already (laughs) been through and (laughs) went through that point. Of his life, like it sounds like it's actually a little bit more busier than Reese was. Reese wasn't. Reese had sensory dis- delays, so he didn't like to touch stuff. So, oh no, he is all about it. <laughs> he still gets about touching stuff, but like now Reese still had to open up my refrigerator, so little Darsha are going to the refrigerator right now. Take something out, but just kind of understanding that, like, I, I, there's a quote that says, "If you know one child with autism, you know one child with autism." One right? child. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't I can't stress that enough, man. Because what they would do is when they first when people first find out, they would just send me all these videos. Look at this guy, he's doing this. Or right. uh, you yeah, know, or you tell yeah. them in the first you, you tell them in the first thing they say is he's a genius. He's he's gonna be, you know, he you know, they love this and that. I'm like, well, you have to realize that's a small portion of that pop of a huge population that are savants like that in certain things like music or maybe painting or whatever that case may be. Not everybody's kid is going to right. develop it. That, so you can't just automatically say that that's going to happen. They're all going to have their different stages. That's why it's called a spectrum and not, hey, you have this or, you know, that. Because Asperger's is on the spectrum. And those people, they have totally different characteristics than maybe a high-functioning autistic kid or in, in terms of what they can do, understand, and how they navigate life. So. Um, I think that's that was just one of the main things that used to piss me off. Like, yo, man, stop sending me these videos. It's cool, and I and it gives me hope, of course. You know what I mean? That my son can do that, but also it's like you're not still not understanding that you know that it's a spectrum, and it, that may not be that because I try to stay even keel about about you know where he's going on his journey. You know, so I don't have too high or too low expectations. So, I think, have y'all ever seen that show, The Good Doctor? Yes, uh, I did. I love that when, show. When, I watched when, it. when that show it. first came out. Everybody sent me that. Hey, look, 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 this is a show about an autistic doctor. And I was like, that's nice. And I was like, but <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I it's like you don't know what you what they want, what they what they are. They trying to say, hey, your son might be a doctor. And like, I'm not saying Malik won't be a doctor, but most likely he's not like. Mm. Right. Because because like the one thing that has been constant on the journey is. I know, I know my child, and, mm. and like that, that's the one thing I know my child, and, and I, I, I think I've told Russ this before. Don't let nobody tell you what your child can do and what he can't do until he proves to you that he can or he can't do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be, because, like I said, like when when he first got his his diagnosis, oh, he's never going to talk. There's days where Malik don't shut up. <laughs> like he, he's never going to go to regular school Malik has gotten on a roll like his last three report cards and I remember he transitioned to, to regular classes like when he started high school and like I was so scared and like it, it, he's been fine with it so but like if I had listened to everybody oh, he's not going to be able to do that he's not going to be able to do that like I don't have limits for him I, I if he shows me he can't do it and it's something he want to do, we'll just figure out another way to do it. Right. And I agree heartily. And I think the other thing those videos does for me, in a sense, well, when Reese was younger, they used to be a little like, oh, well, that's hopeful. That's great. And I know your son's sick. But now Reese is 12. So when people send me a video of a 12-year-old boy leading a choir or painting a picture, it actually makes me feel bad. Because I'm like, dang, you know, like this kid leading a choir. Or this kid's, you know, doing this. And you know what I'm saying? I'll hand Reese a pencil when he throw it. He throw it in my face. And then I'm looking at this video of this 12-year-old boy, you know what I'm saying? Um, doing a, you know what I'm saying? Leading a, a choir in front of a thousand people. Meanwhile, my son, I just hand him a microphone and he threw it in my face. So at this point, it's kind of like, 
I'm getting a good grasp of what his capabilities are. Um, and those videos, in a sense, like they're like, oh, like, I mean, it's always great to see someone with autism doing something dope. Don't get me wrong. But if you're sending it to me as a way to say, this is what your son can be, this is what your son can do, in a sense, they almost make me feel like, damn, man, like, Reese isn't yeah. doing it. You know, am I'm I not doing it? Yeah, yeah. It makes you feel like, <laughs> am I not doing enough? Am I, you know, yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> you know, because I'm, I, uh, you know, the therapy bills say I am, you know, so, <laughs> so right, exactly. Am I not, yeah, yeah. You know, the therapy bills say I am. I'm doing, I'm doing a whole lot, but, um, but yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, man. It's just like, hey, I just try to stay even keel, like whatever he's. I'm trying to learn better to be into what he's into, and it gives me opportunities to act like a kid and silly, and we go around and flap and spin around in the store and people looking at us crazy. I just laugh because I'm like, y'all don't get it. But as long as he's that smile is on his face, I'm 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 good. You know what I mean? I don't even worry about it. I used to I used to, but now I don't. I'm like, hey, we're gonna cut up and it, the thing is that make sure he's having a good time. Um and so it just looks different. So Yeah, no, it's major. All right. Um well look I'm well I'm actually a bit over on the time. I try to go an hour. I have been going an hour in like a year. So anybody watching I apologize. Um, the problem is I started watching another podcast, like All the Smoke with Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson. I watch that a lot, if y'all watch that. And uh, they always go like an hour and a half. So I don't feel as bad now when I go over yeah. an hour. Because I figure you got like, a million viewers and they go like an hour and a half episodes. If I go a little over an hour, I'm not that pressed. But my mom yells at me all the time when I go over an hour. So, out of respect for my mama, um, I'm, I'm gonna look to wrap it up. Um, we lost Buddy again, but um, uh, Mel, Terrell, let the guys people know where they can find you guys. Anything, um, any personal business or entrepreneurship or whatever you guys got going on, uh, let let them know where they can find that as well. Um, I don't have nothing entrepreneurial going on right now, um, but. I'm on Instagram, uh, Melvin DeGrate, D-E-G-R-A-T-E, um, Melvin Little on Facebook. Like, and it, like, like, like what Reese said, like, when he, I first saw that he had, his son had autism, I reached out to him. Like, it, the one thing is, I always tell people, if you ask me a question about, and I don't know the answer, I, I'll at least point you to somebody who does. Maybe Reese knows it. Like my sister, um, her son is on the spectrum. Like a lot of times we'll go back and forth with ideas and stuff. Um, the thing is, don't, don't, you're not by yourself. Like that's what I want people to realize. You're not by yourself. There's, there's millions of parents out there just like you who's looking for somebody to talk to. Yeah, I agree, man. I'm, I'm with you on that, man. Just somebody to talk to, just to, you know, even if you don't understand, just listen to them and, you know, you can, the, the power to the internet, you know what I mean? Maybe you can just still help them and, and point them in the right direction. Uh, like, um, not, not to cut you, like, I remember when Rush's son was, uh, when Reese was, maybe, I forgot, he was, he, he was still before five or six and he, he texted me one day, he was like, hey, does Malik do this? And like, we've had a lot of conversations like, Hey, does Malik do this? Like, does, does Rush do this? I mean, really Rush do this and, and, and stuff like that. So, because a lot of times with your kid, you'll see him do something and you'd be like, Oh, that's, he the only one to do that. No, like the watching the, you, when your daughter gets older, what, wait till she starts watching the same clip over and over and over again. And you're like, like my son will watch a uh, Oscar the Grouch video Sesame Street video the same ten seconds over and over and over and over and over oh, and over man. again. Man, that, uh, man, that's that, crazy. The YouTube fans is crazy, and it's like Reese listens like to gospel music, but he won't let it get past like the first twenty seconds. Like any song he gets fixated on, he just gets stuck on like a twenty seconds yeah. of the song. Go back to the twenty seconds of the song. That's so interesting. When he gets to Boogie on Down, Malik starts the song all over again. We rode <laughs> to the beach one time. <laughs> Me, him, and his mom rode to the beach, and he played um, Journey, Don't Stop Believing, for oh, four man. hours. For four oh, hours. He made us restart the song every <laughs> time it got to a certain point. Oh, man. Yeah, see, my son doesn't do that with me, but he does it on on toys. 
So like if he once he figures out the pattern of a toy to make a certain sound, he'll just keep going back in that circle and he's figured it out. I'm like, see, he's smarter than he lets on because he's able to know if I hit it three times, it's gonna make that noise. And he'll just keep doing it, hitting it three times and make that noise. So that's so funny that they do that, you know what I mean? Regardless. So um, oh yeah, so yeah, you guys can find me at Money Mitch 1984. As you've seen, uh, my wife, she has a great um uh, uh autism page that shows just some of the things that we do uh working with him you know whether it's puzzles or you know different types of sensory things um and that's us plus asd uh that you can find uh her at so that's yeah us plus asd i think i find it she does workouts and stuff doesn't she Yes, yes, she does workouts. She she talks about meal prepping, um, you know, for them. She, you know, she does all the little sensory activities that we do. She posts those um, for people. As, like you said, Melvin, just ideas, um, you know, for them to use, you know, because sometimes it's just, you know, we're doing the same thing. We're all trying to figure it out. Nobody knows. It's no blueprint to this. There's no right or wrong way to do it. You have to do what works for you. So that's what I want to encourage everybody to do because it's going to, uh, I think I think it was Melvin who said it earlier, it's going to be people to say, ah, I wouldn't do that or don't give them this. So why are you doing this right here for them? And you have to lo- let them know, hey, you know your child. You've talked to the doctors. This is a part of something that he's going to have to do uh, to, to you know continue on his journey. And so I just say, yeah, you got to do what's best for you in autism. You can't worry about what other people are saying. Um, talk to your doctors, you know, uh, mental health therapy as well. Like if you're really feeling that bad, you don't have anybody personally personal, go to therapy, man. Go and have somebody that you can just talk to to get your feelings out there, um, you know, so that way you can feel like you're being heard and maybe get some guidance. I I can't stress how important uh, that is because it it does get hard and you can find yourself in some dark places sometimes. So, Yeah, definitely, man. Therapy works. And yeah, I know I say that every episode, so I'm glad to roll, you know, getting this segment that therapy works. Therapy is helpful. Um, if you black parent, you should probably be in therapy. If you're a black man, you definitely should be in therapy. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 You yeah. said something yeah. right there. Yeah. Right. So, um, like, and, and it's really helpful. It's really hurt. But it doesn't mean that you're crazy. It doesn't mean that you need medication. It doesn't mean anything like that. All it means is that at some point in your life, you dealt with some trauma that you need to work through. Um, think about it like car maintenance, right? So, like, it doesn't matter how great you know what I'm saying? You are at maintaining your vehicle. At some point, you got to go to the shop. The same thing, that's what therapy is for your brain, right? doesn't matter how great your life was, how bad your life was. At some point, the worse it is, the more work you need, of course. But like, even if you had the greatest life ever, you still need routine maintenance. So I, I highly recommend talking to your job, uh, EAP program to get into the therapist, looking it up. If you're a black man, they have a lot of free therapy programs just because you're a black man and there's so few of us going to therapy. Um, so I highly recommend that um, for you guys. Um, this has been a real pleasure, guys, man. Um, I, I really hope that, you know, both of you guys are um, open to coming back on uh, to the show. Maybe not to talk about autism, but just talk about something else, man. I, this is the end of my fatherhood journey. Um, I did this is the third episode of the fatherhood journey. So if you guys have been paying attention, the first one was about just fatherhood in general from the time you find out she's pregnant to the time that she gives birth. The second episode was like trying to balance being a father and dating and relationships and all that stuff. And this one I want to talk about being a father of a child with uh, with a child, being a father of a child with special needs. So that was, um, this is his third episode. That was something I wanted to ask you about too, Russ, and and we ran out of time. I was going to say, because you, you were, you, you were single and dating with, with Reese and like, like I, I became single, um, and was dating with Malik and it, that part right there, like when you meet somebody and you explain to them, Hey, my child has autism. Like, like I I've started paying attention because you get a lot of people be like, Oh, well I've dealt with somebody with autism. Know nothing right. about it. Know nothing right. about it. And like, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh no, it's tough. So, um, I mean, I won't go into too much detail because I want to let the people go, but like my ex was amazing with my daughter. Like my, she was amazing with my daughter. But her and my son, you can tell that there was some disconnect. That wasn't on her, and she tried. And I would never take anything. She really tried. She would ask me questions about it. But you can tell that there was still, like, that feeling of, I've never dealt with this before. My ex didn't have any children at all. You know what I'm saying? So 
it was still like that that feeling of I I haven't dealt with this before. What do I do? And she tried her behind off. So I give her all the respect. I give her a round of applause. You know, I've uh, I've never dated anyone else who met my kids, but like I've talked to people on the phone and like they've heard him in the background or I've been on the video call and they've seen him in the background and like I've seen their faces curl up before. But like you know, it's tough and it's a real difficult thing to kind of figure out when to bring that partner into your child's life. So maybe that's another episode we can do down the road. Um, my next episode, <laughs> my next episode is actually about sex, guys. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so the next episode is actually going to be about sex, guys. Um, I have uh, two two amazing brothers. You know uh, X uh, is coming on, Melvin. You know X. Yeah. Um, it's coming on. And a good, and actually, this will be his third time returning. The other guy's name is uh, A.B. Bracewell. He'll be returning for the third time. He's actually doing a series on his own podcast about the sexual education of black men. And uh, it's funny. I texted him. I'm like, hey, you got anybody you recommend for an episode about sex on my show? And he responded, myself. Um, so um, we'll be, we're going to be talking about sex and um, the emotional impact of, you know, sex on, on men, right? Because I feel like so often women in particular believe that we just kind of go in sex and have and just kind of get out. But I think that it also plays a role in, in, in uh, shaping our lives. So the next episode will be on May 5th. If I and, re- and real quick, I just want to thank you, brothers, because this picture almost took me out back here. I appreciate it. I saw that. I saw yeah, that. yeah. It almost, it almost took me. It almost lost my life back here. I was trying to stay cool. I'm like, look, I just got to stay, stay cool. We definitely got to do this again, though, guys. Like, something, something, and we all like basketball. Maybe when I do the sports episode, we come back on and talk about hoop dreams. <laughs> oh, definitely. 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 I'm down for that one. I'm down hey, for that I one. got some but, stories. <laughs> <laughs> and Mel, Terrell, if it's cool with y'all, I'll, um, I'll, I'll connect you guys, too, if that's cool with you guys. If Buddy was here, yeah. I'll probably connect you. Yeah, well, yeah, for sure. I'll connect you, too, guys. I think that that – the biggest help for me was people like yourself, Melvin, who reached out to me. People like Cleveland, I don't know if he's watching them, but Cleveland Johnson was another brother that reached out to me right away when I found out recently diagnosed. And that's what helped me through that storm. Like, women, as much as we love them, right, like, they'll give you their support, but it's nothing like being in the trenches with another black brother, right? Um, and right. Terrell, I think that's how we clicked when we had that conversation. Yeah. It was like, oh, damn, like, he a black guy. Like, he's a black brother, too, with the same yeah. story. Like, yeah, right, man. right, right, right. Indeed, <laughs> man. Network, man. So that when you have the moments, you have someone that you can lean on. Indeed, indeed, indeed. It's been a pleasure, bro. Yes, sir. Yeah. So um, I yes, appreciate sir. y'all for coming on, man. Y'all have a great night, man. Um, And I'll, and I'll chat with y'all in two weeks. All right. All right.